So I do want to welcome everyone. Uh, for those who are returning from last time, obviously you like us enough to come back, so thank you. And for all the new attendees, uh, welcome to what is becoming a fun monthly series. And I wanted to start always with a little bit of perspective. Most of us here are in integrative healthcare. When I say integrative, we treat the individual. Uh, we may treat symptoms, but we try to find root, find root causes. And when I was a kid, the magic school bus was probably the single best way to start learning a little bit about the human body and the anatomy physiology of it was just kind of fascinating. And uh, the realities of the situation are, you know, some healthcare professionals who specialize don't necessarily integrate. You know, I've seen where uh, a cardiologist and a gastroenterologist would have a lot of benefit communicating with each other. And that's kind of my hope today to introduce some new concepts in terms of adding more tools in the toolbox to treat the entire person. Because you have to remember, there are certain aspects of the human body that you can't escape. One rule that I like to live by when working with clients is everything affects everything. And considering we're going system by system, starting with energy, we've moved to the cardiovascular system and a little plug for next month, we'll be diving into the lymphatic system. Uh, we can't escape that. So I want to start with a few interesting things, hopefully to pique your curiosity, because Sometimes anatomy physiology can be a little bit dry, but putting things in perspective is a huge, uh, a huge help when it comes to making it more interesting. So your heart is about the size of your fist and it is the most inexhaustible muscle in your body. The next one was incredible to me. If you lay out your entire circulatory system and I had to convert this, I'm Canadian, I had to convert this into imperial for everyone, it would be about 60,000 miles long. So for perspective, that's four trips around the globe. That's how much highway of vasculature exists inside of us. And through those 60,000 miles, your blood circulates approximately six quarts, give or take, you know, a bit depending upon the size of the person, every three minutes, which means every organ in your body is receiving that blood every three minutes. It's being filtered. Things are being delivered where they need to go. Wastes are being removed. And in a single day, your heart will beat 100,000 times a day, 35 million times in a year, and in a lifetime, that gives us about 2.5 billion heartbeats. And if you look at it this way, if your heart is engineered to beat only a certain number of times while you're alive in this lifetime, you better make sure that you find a way to take care of it so those beats can take place over as long as possible. I think the most interesting aspect is the, the next one. The capillary beds, which we'll get into the smallest aspect of your microvasculature, are eight to 10 microns, or for the people in the metric system, 0 0.001 millimeters in diameter. That's large enough for a single red blood cell. It's incredibly tiny, but our health is dependent upon a single red blood cell being able to flow through a very tiny tube. Anything that compromises that, as we'll see, um, can have long lasting impacts. And, you know, if we could capture the amount of blood per beat, we would actually have a third of a cup of blood each time your heart would beat. And that number can vary based upon someone being an elite athlete or someone being chronically sick. So it's really important to understand the scope of importance that the system that a lot of us gloss over uh, really holds within the body because the heart in and of itself, it's a chamber system and it's a pump. So fundamentally you have a, systems of val a system of valve and chambers. The chambers momentarily hold the blood in a very specific sequence to connect pulmonary circulation with systemic circulation. And the valves are there to allow unidirectional flow to the next chamber. The deoxygenated blood has to flow into the heart to get pumped to the lungs. Then it's got to get pumped back to the heart to be sent around the body. And an important concept is this unidirectional flow because the cardiovascular system is a closed system. And in a closed system, if you have inefficiencies, everything that that system relies upon, all these different tissues and cells receiving blood, oxygen, and nutrients becomes compromised. We can't escape a little bit of an examination of the heart just so we're all up to speed and on the same page. So the heart is actually structured into three main layers. The epicardium, which forms the outer layer of the heart, its main job is to encase the internals, but also to be a place for fatty deposits and the circulatory system that actually feeds blood to the heart to exist. The workhorse of the heart is the myocardium, which is the muscular layer that contracts the blood. And the myocardium is actually very trainable. The myocardium of an elite athlete is probably one of the most mitochondrial dense organs 
in the entire human body, which is, you know, piggybacking off the last lecture. But the myocardium is also very um, energetically intensive and anything that compromises energy metabolism will compromise the body's ability to pump blood around the, the, the entire system. And lastly, there's the endocardium. So that's the, the outer layer, which basically encases everything, sorry. And epicardium is the inner layer, much like the inside of your vasculature. And it does operate into four different chambers and two of which are atriums, two of which are ventricles. And the four valves allow the flow of blood to be very much categorized into deoxygenated blood being reoxygenated, oxygenated blood being pumped throughout the system. And that process returns, as I mentioned before, every three minutes, because direction does matter. A lot of issues that relate to the heart are internal areas of physiologic stress that compromise the efficiency of how well the heart can blood, pump blood and ultimately nutrition and oxygen around the body. As you can see from the left to the right, the inferior and the superior vena cava is where the deoxygenated blood comes back in. And every diagram out there shows the deoxygenated blood is blue. That is not the case. It is more like a murky brown, which is a lot less of an attractive color, but it's a lot easier for teaching if we see it as blue. So it comes into the right atrium, gets pumped to the right ventricle, pumped out to the lungs. After it's been deoxygenated and reoxygenated, the gas exchange happens at two specific places, the most important happening within the lungs, where the oxygen saturates the blood once again. It's pumped back into the left atrium, to the left ventricle, and pumped directly out the aorta, and that enters systemic circulation. So the whole concept of why we wanted to go to the cardiovascular system next piggybacking off of energy metabolism is the heart's main job is to pump oxygen around the body. And the things that piggyback on that are delivering all the other nutrients and signaling molecules that our organs, tissues, and cells ultimately need to maintain the ability to communicate with each other. The heart is only half of the system. The other half of the system is actually the vasculature. So the inner highway, as I call it, we have veins and arteries which essentially are carrying either blood towards the heart in the context of the veins or carrying blood away from the heart in the context of arteries. And they go from big to small in terms of their hierarchy. So veins become venules when they get smaller. And then when they meet at the capillary beds, that's when arteries and veins intersect. So at the capillary beds, you have the other aspect of gas exchange. Because if you remember from cellular respiration, we need oxygen to make ATP energy but we also make carbon dioxide in the process and the body has to do something with this carbon dioxide and also the waste materials that are excreted as a part of normal metabolism. So the gas exchange and nutrient points come together in the capillary beds, which are very important and arguably speaking, the most important aspect of this inner highway of the cardiovascular system. And it's here where the body can take waste materials, carbon dioxide, bring it back to the lungs, we can remove a lot of that through simply exhaling the carbon dioxide, and we can pick up fresh oxygen that we breathed in to start the process over and over again. So the capillary beds in the lungs are the two places in, in many cases where the magic does happen. And we do have to understand that there is an important distinction or a difference between the veins and the arteries. The diagram alone shows you a massive difference where the arteries have a much narrower inside, so their tube has a much smaller diameter, and there's a much larger muscular layer where the veins have a much larger blood reservoir capacity. And if you stop and you think about this for a minute, anytime there's an issue with the cardiovascular system, more often than not, it's the arteries because anything that will stress the arteries will start to narrow the tube. And if anyone was like me, when your parents were watering the garden and you would go around the corner and pinch off the hose, you know exactly what happens to the garden hose. The same thing is true. The only difference here is if we start to narrow too many of those arteries, we get a deficiency of flow. So either blood coming back to the heart becomes compromised in, in terms of the amount of liquid that can flow through. And the more that happens, the more we start to place what's called a shear stress on the walls of the arteries. And this can start to really harm the fragile tissue because like the gut, the endothelium inside of an artery is only a single cell layer thick. And when they get damaged, they're very susceptible to becoming very compromised as time goes on and that inflammation and damage doesn't heal. So knowing the difference between the different kinds of circulation, when we talk pulmonary circulation, that's between the heart and the lungs. 
And systemic circulation is essentially the oxygenated blood being sent back to the heart before it becomes systemically delivered to all organs and tissues in the body. So if you understand the concept of why we breathe again, without cardiovascular health, without a strong heart, without the ability to bind oxygen properly with hemoglobin, we can't actually deliver energy to tissues properly because oxygen, as I mentioned before, was the final electron acceptor inside of the mitochondria. And anytime you're not making oxygen aerobically, you start to compromise a system because it becomes slightly hypoxic. So the path of circulation is really important to remember because we as clinicians make a lot of choices that are automated or systemic. You know, we give lots of different supplements in the interest of giving our clients vitamins and minerals. We give them antioxidants. We give them, uh, you know, various things to help with a nutritional status that may be inadequate. What we want to make sure is that we understand what we're talking about within the circulatory system and making sure that we can monitor things within the circulatory system that may give us inferences of understanding if our treatments or our modalities are actually being well received or truly effective by the body. This is a really cool depiction to understand the difference between systemic and pulmonary circulation. And on the left hand side, what I like about this graphic is it shows us the different intersection points. So the two points of gas exchange, as I mentioned, in the lungs, you have oxygenation. And then when it comes to the capillary beds, that's where the oxygen is delivered and the carbon dioxide is picked up. And this system is running all times a day. And if you look to the right hand side, you see just how much oxygen each organ actually needs. We know that the brain is a very uh, oxygen hungry organ, but look at the kidneys, look at the liver, look at the skeletal muscle. Anytime you have a deficiency of oxygen, you have a deficiency or a drop in efficiency of metabolism. And if you think about all the things that the kidneys and the liver do for our body, uh, that's how we make sure that we don't have an increased toxic load or toxic burden that stays in the circulatory system. Because water is the universal solvent for everything and the vast majority of what circulates in our blood is water. So these compounds have to be able to be filtered out properly so they don't continuously circulate in our system, causing long-standing issues that may show up in months or years, depending upon the person. And then it actually, you know, we get a little bit further zoomed out in the context of how our body works. So I call this the coordination of contraction. Our heart needs to get a signal from somewhere. So the cardiac cycle is essentially the coordinated rhythm of the heartbeat. And this is where the context of blood pressure comes in. So people know that 120 over 80 is normal blood pressure, but either most of us have forgotten it or we never really dove in to understand the intricate details of how this actually plays out in our system. So when we talk about systole or systolic blood pressure, that's the pressure measured in the vasculature when the blood is being pumped out of the heart. And that's directly related to the power of the heart muscle, the efficiency of the stroke volume, things of that nature. The diastole or the diastolic pressure is the pressure that remains when the heart is in a resting state. So if we look at the nefarious intent, when we have a rise in both aspects of pressure, well, we know that we're trying to force liquid through a narrow tube. So not only is it inefficient, it is potentially hazardous to the fragile tissues of those tubes. And in my opinion, diastole is even more so because if the pressure in the tube is very high at a resting state, we can likely infer that there is a lot of blockage or a partial blockage in the ability for liquid to flow through that tube. And of course, there has to be something in the body that regulates this and the conduction system, which basically consists of the synatrial node, the atrioventricular node, um, those are the ones that essentially coordinate the rhythmic contraction of the left and the right atriums contracting just at the perfect sequence of timing. And those messages are basically delivered down what's called the bundle of hiss, comes back through the bundle branches and the connection terminates in the Purkinje fibers and then it starts all over again. So each heartbeat is dependent upon our autonomic nervous system. And a lot of people don't understand the implications of how important it is to work with the autonomic nervous system, especially for those clients who are struggling with some kind of cardiovascular issue. We know sympathetic is fight or flight. We know parasympathetic is rest and digest, but we don't wanna have all one or none of the other. Sympathetic is not bad, parasympathetic is not good, it's contextual. In the case of the heart, when we have a rise or an increase in sympathetic drive, it basically tells the heart to fire more quickly. 
When we have an increase in parasympathetic activity, it tells the heart to fire less quickly. In a long-term vision of an ideal situation, more parasympathetic activity is better. Why? Because it allows the heart to beat in a more relaxed and variable context. If anyone works with clients here, looking at heart rate variability is a great overarching way to understand what's going on with that client's nervous system. Because if we understand where they are, we understand how that connects to potential issues within the cardiovascular system. Because sympathetic is increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, vasoconstriction, and it requires a lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine, because those are the two compounds that mediate communication through the sympathetic nervous system. The opposite is true of parasympathetic, so it reduces heart rate, it reduces blood pressure. It allows for the release of nitric oxide, which allows for vasodilation. So not only does blood flow through the tubes more effectively, reducing harm in the, the microvasculature of the arteries, but it also carries more oxygen because it's flowing more effortlessly. So we're delivering more energy potential to tissues and that's mediated via, via acetylcholine. And both of these branches of the autonomic nervous system innervate right into the heart. So this is happening autonomously for all of us right now. My sympathetic system is gonna be a lot more engaged than yours, hopefully. And hopefully I'm not putting you to sleep to throw you into parasympathetic, but it's important to understand the connection points because what we're trying to do is work with the body to regulate the whole concept of everything affects everything. If you can improve the communication between both branches of the nervous system, you can indirectly improve specific aspects of the cardiovascular system, the heart, its stroke volume, its cardiac output efficiency, but you can also allow for those blood uh, delivery molecules, nutrients, hormones, what have you, to be delivered to their end destinations. I'll give everyone a quick moment here just to look at some of the relationships. And you can see it's a very much yin and yang relationship. But the important thing to remember in the, concept, in the context of systemic health, sympathetic is using energy resources. It is fight or flight. It is burning through energy at an accelerated rate which also means it's correlated with potential inflammation. When there's a chronic inflammatory load, be it somewhere in the body and anything that affects inflammation locally will affect systemically eventually, that's gonna keep the body in a sympathetic state, which is gonna harm the cardiovascular system. When we can access a parasympathetic state, that's when true healing takes place. And outside of sports, athletics, exercise, stuff of that nature, uh, the human body wants to be biased towards parasympathetic, and that is very much correlated with low aspects of inflammation. So when we understand the sympathetic upregulation and the parasympathetic downregulation, the most important aspect here is the sympathetic system is always fast or faster. And in terms of a healthy person, that's okay. But I want to ask everyone this. Has the last two or three years been a relaxed thing for us all to be living in? It has been a very sympathetically dominant aspect of life, some, uh, something that we've probably never seen before. And a lot of people have likely been struggling with burning the candle at both ends. And if someone's already potentially compromised or working with some sort of chronic issue, this tends to further problems. And we would need to know how to show up for these clients or these people that we're supporting to understand how the body's interconnectedness works together and how to make decisions more effectively as a clinician. So measuring something like heart rate variability and understanding what supplements or what interventions allow your client to have a better display of overall health is something that I espouse. I work with all my clients in that way. And everyone on the team, unfortunately, has to listen to me talk about HRV all the time. And then there's talking about some of the more new age aspects of the heart. So we know that we have a central nervous system. We have uh, an enteric nervous system in the gut. This is new research, and we don't know very much about this as a science yet, but those little yellow bundle, bundles rather, are actually proof of a nervous system that exists within the heart. The heart has its own neurites, if you will, which is somewhere between 30 and 40 billion bundles of neurons that communicate with other nervous systems in the body. And it's a very important concept to have all of your nervous systems able to communicate with each other. Because if you don't, you have a down regulation of energy potential in the body and the nervous system basically relies upon backup systems. And when, when we do so, we're starting to get into a point of being chronically depleted as individuals. And anything that depletes energy in the body is a quick way for the path of illness to develop. 
So the heart in and of itself has some very interesting qualities that no other organ in the body has. Talking about energy last time, we know that the mitochondria is the only thing in the body that turns the food and the calories we eat into the ATP that our cells use to do work. And probably next to the brain and the liver, the heart has the highest density of mitochondrial of all organs in the body. And in terms of its energy level, the heart is designed to burn high quality fats. It is a, a muscle. It's the only muscle in the body that never actually gets a break. So the flow of our lymphatic system and the quality of our diet directly correlate with the potential of quality energy our heart is able to produce for itself. And in terms of the magnetic field, if you look at the interesting research done by the HeartMath Institute, the heart's magnetic field is more than eight times larger than that of the brain. It's also the first organ that forms when uh, a fetus is developing. So, you know, nature knew the importance of the heart. So when we talk about being heart open or heart centered, um, we're not only talking from a spiritual belief perspective, we're talking from a perspective of understanding it's the bedrock of maintaining health in our bodies. And in 2022, heart disease is still the number one killer in North America. Cancer is number two. The thing that I can't figure out is why do we never hear anything about heart cancer? It's a very rare, if not disease that never pops up. And one thing that is very interesting is the heart being the most electrically active organ, the magnetic field is proof of that. Electrically active organs and cells have a hard time developing cancer. So what ends up happening in terms of the heart is we wear out its energy metabolism potential and it's not cancer that takes the heart out. It's essentially a degradation or a decline in the efficiency of the tissues and the heart's ability to express magnetic and electric energy. And everything we do contributes to that based upon the kind of food we eat, the kind of water we drink, the amount of stress we're under, and the amount of time we give ourselves to rest. And the heart and the cardiovascular system obviously takes precedent in terms of understanding today, but blood is an essential aspect um, because it's the universal transport and the universal solvent medium. You know, the main roles of blood are the five things there. So it's a transport medium for nutrients and hormones. So everything we digest, hopefully, has to get into the body somewhere. And it's the blood and the circulatory system that delivers it to all these tissues and cells. Our, our immune system next to the gut is most highly concentrated in our circulatory system because we do need some sort of surveillance to make sure that nothing has got in our body's circulatory system that is potentially harmful or damaging to us. We do know it's an oxygen delivery system, but it's also a waste removal system. The capillary beds, in addition to the lymphatic vessels, are very much um, primed and essential when it comes to removing all the metabolic wastes that our bodies just produce living. And also the formation of clots. When there's an injury in the arterial wall, um, that artery injury needs to be remedied somehow. And things like platelets are actually very strategically set up to form an appropriate clot, which is the beginning of the attempt to heal. So if our blood's not flowing, if we have an inability to deliver blood because of a potential blockage, uh, a narrowing of arteries, an increase in blood pressure without uh, a proportional increase in flow, well, what does this mean for all the organs, the tissues, and ultimately the cells that are relying upon all these nutrients, all these immune cells, what have you, to be delivered? It becomes compromised. And what does that look like for an individual? Well, when there's no nutritional value being delivered, that's how you develop long latent nutrient deficiencies. When there's no oxygen being delivered, that's how you develop hypoxia. And you switch on alternative mechanisms that basically require the body to go into a stress response. What does that do? That activates the sympathetic nervous system because you're in a crisis mode and the entire system becomes neg negatively affected and it's a perpetual feedback loop. So as clinicians, you know, unless you have access to an EKG or some advanced technology, the best we can do is monitor what's going on with our clients. I do this with every one of my pro athletes that I work with. It, it's a non-negotiable because what they're demanding of their bodies is incredibly stressful. So a basic screen doesn't tell you everything that's going on, but it gives you inferences or allows you to make some uh, important connections. Looking at some of these biomarkers, which we can talk about in detail in a later call, are ways to understand if there is a potential injury that's popping up in the cardiovascular system that you need to be mindful of. Because basic health is quite simple. You know, a cell needs these five things to survive. Oxygen, water, macromolecules, things like proteins, amino acids, fats, carbohydrates, micromolecules, vitamins, minerals, and whatever signaling molecule helps a cell function. 
And low energy status is essentially the inability to thrive. We can survive for a while, but it's not thriving. But a cell also needs to be able to vacate things like metabolic waste, organic acids, broken down proteins, fats, exogenous toxic compounds that may come from you know, our environment. And if injuries are happening in the cardiovascular system, the delivery and the removal process becomes compromised. And it's not that cholesterol is a problem in and of itself, it's the interplay between everything. So the real issue with cardiovascular disease and associated issues are actually based upon injury, something that has caused an injury to a fragile endothelial cell. And when there's any kind of immune and inflammatory response, that's the first step of healing. But if that injury is sustained because of factors, you know, getting into our bloodstream from some foreign external source, well, the long-term strategy the body has is, well, I'm going to keep trying to lay down and heal new tissue, but eventually inflammation becomes degradation. So a blockage can form. And if that block, that cap becomes unstable, that blockage can migrate. And when we see that happening, that's what usually causes some major issue that requires a triple or a quadruple bypass because blood isn't getting back to and from the heart anymore and the body is starving for energy. So the degradation of the arteries, things like shear stress, systemic vascular resistance, stiffness index, vasoconstriction, all these things can be measured nowadays if you have the right kinds of technology. But... The thing about this graphic that makes me most scared is it says from fourth decade of life, a complicated lesion. That's not all that long to be on the planet. It is a progressive thing, but it's not singularly focused in terms of its cause or its origin. It's a complex interplay with inflammation and some kind of dysfunction in the cardiovascular system being at cause. And this graphic is just so impactful to me. You can see what ends up happening. And if things narrow and you get a clot, we know the possible downstream causes of what that can induce inside the human body. So when it comes to working with a cardiovascular system, all we're really trying to do is keep the heart strong and keep the arteries and the veins working clearly so they can pump things in and out of the system that need to be there and don't need to be there. And this is going to be sent out. So this is just a quick little association of any of the inflammatory conditions or dysfunctions associated with specific anatomy within the heart and specifically within the cardiovascular system itself. And the little uh, hint at the bottom there, lymphatics and lymphedema, that's where we're gonna be going next because I believe the lymphatic system is an aspect that's not really well discussed, not really well understood. And it's a huge opportunity for removing waste and getting back to health because the body is a very regenerative organism. So Master Supplements US Enzymes is a digestive company and the associations that are being made between Research and obviously, you know, anecdotal experience clinically are showing the gut and the brain has a connection very strongly uh, interlinked between the nervous system, but the gut and the heart are actually becoming very highly interplayed because we have to understand directly below the epithelial layer is general circulation. The capillary beds that I mentioned interface at the tight junctions or just below the tight junctions in the epithelial cells. We know they're only a single layer thick, and the gut is a very poorly constructed barrier. It's a great absorptive surface, but it's a very poorly constructed barrier because we want to make sure that we can maximize absorption potential of all those vitamins, minerals, macronutrients that we're consuming in our diet that are hopefully high quality. The capillary beds and the lacteals, which is the direct entry point to systemic circulation, is right underneath. And, you know, drawing specific conclusions are still in the early days, but you know, purported mechanisms of interplay are things like dysbiosis, diet, the microbiome in general, and its ability to produce things like butyrate, the downregulation of tight junction function, so leaky gut and barrier dysfunction, and ultimately the translocation of things like lipopolysaccharides, toxic waste materials, contents from the gut getting into the circulatory system, getting into the lymphatic system, will always recruit the immune system. Anytime you recruit the immune system, you have an inflammatory response. Anytime you have an inflammatory response, cytokines are being released. And anytime cytokines are released, white blood cells are being attracted to the site of inflammation. If this process is happening over and over and over again inside the 60,000 miles of cardiovascular system that we have in our bodies, 
you can see how over the course of four or five, six decades, most people develop some degree of clogged artery problem. I mean, most of us on this call, unfortunately to say, have some degree of issue. So metabolic endotoxemia, which is kind of the focus of this or the study, really is starting to gain a lot of traction as to explain why something like leaky gut, poor digestion, and inflammatory dysbiosis ultimately negatively impact the cardiovascular system, stressing the heart, breaking down the arteries, and ultimately making the body worse at carrying nutrients and oxygen to the tissues of need. And then on top of that, adding in things like environmental compounds, food allergies or sensitivities, sluggish lymphatic systems, lymphatic systems rather, and poor detoxification, um, it's a recipe for the body slowly stressing itself out, and it triggers things like a cell danger response, a chronic inflammatory response. Um, and unless we remove the insult, we never have the ability to fully take our, our foot off of the gas pedal that's driving the inflammatory response in and of itself. The analogy I use with my clients is, it's like trying to put out a fire with water when someone's throwing a little bit of gasoline on the fire the entire time. You're never going to smolder the embers properly. So what do we do? Now is the fun part, because now Jason and I get to go back and forth in terms of talking about some clinical insights. I do want to draw attention to the fact that I found a superhero a superoxide dismutase. Like that, that is a thing. It's out there on the internet. And he is That's taking, awesome. he's taken down hydrogen peroxide like nobody's business. I'm impressed. I, I want more of that. So I'm going to introduce an idea, a, a topic of conversation with a product rather, and I'm going to let Jason go into some of the clinical insights. So when talking about directly supporting the health of the cardiovascular system, specifically the arteries, lumberzyme is something that's really good for helping to break down arterial plaque. Jason, you want, want to elaborate? Yes. So um, I also like to get into the specifics of, you know, activity units, because that's one thing that drives um, our fellow clinicians absolutely nuts. They're like, why can't you just list things in milligrams? And enzymes just flat out don't work that way. Like you could have a capsule full of 180 milligrams of enzyme that has virtually zero activity into it, or one with 180 milligrams with an enormous amount of activity. So it's just like, trying to list a probiotic in milligrams. So just so that is understood, um, I wanted to talk about the activity units in this product, which lumbrokinase is really hard because it, everyone can have their own uh, unit of you know, designation. So the, I guess to break it down simply, two of these would be a highly, highly therapeutic amount, hence the 62 capsules. So kind of like you know, the, the theme with our company is to try to fit a therapeutic amount into a bottle so it'll last a month. So the typical way that we dose this would be one at bed and then one in the morning before you get up or two at bed and um, you let it do its, its business at night, which is when the body is healing and the more we understand about the brain um, and lumbrokinase's ability to get across the brain blood barrier it becomes definitely the most important time to take it. So if your patient's like, oh, I'd rather just take it at bed or in the morning, just tell them to take it at bed, hands down. So um, another thing about an enzyme, especially like a, a proteolytic like um, lumbrokinase, is it has the ability to break down a lot of proteins that are hiding potential infections in the bloodstream, which I'll touch on a little bit more later. And then you spoke so eloquently about the amount of light essentially that is produced by the heart and almost zero cancer happens in the heart, which is, you know, kind of an interesting um, theory when it comes to, you know, energy medicine is enzymes actually carry by photonic light. So if you're going to look at something to give to your body that desperately needs light, let, it, let alone our heart, you really can't go wrong um, with enzymes. And L-arginine, knowing uh, that we need L-arginine for the nitric oxide boost, astrozyme is contained in this product, which you know, boosts L-arginine absorption by over 40%. So just a nice all-in-one product for not only dissolving your blood clots, which it's most famous for, but everything else we just mentioned. Anything I missed, buddy? No, that was great. And I think a lot of people ask clinically, so we have lumbrokinase, we have natokinase, and I like to frame things for people because 
a lot of clinicians are not taught to think of enzymes as the first line of defense for the cardiovascular system. We think essential fatty acids, we think magnesium, we think things of that nature, you know, vitamin E, what have you. Uh, lumbar kinase works only when a specific protein fibrin is present, if I understand correctly, Jason. So yes, okay. some people have to work with uh, a client who has a cardiologist. They may be using something like warfarin or a blood thinner. So lumbar kinase, as I see it, is something that's really strategically um, appropriate for someone who would be using a blood thinner because it is slightly different of a mechanism of action from natokinase, correct? That is correct. And But always use caution when someone's on, especially a high dose of blood thinners. But just another thing, if the your, your patient asks, um, INR has not really been shown to be shifted with lumbar kinase where with a natokinase or serrati even a serratio peptidase, it can, be, it can be tossed around a bit. So how would you frame natokinase in a different sense to know where you would start with one or the other? Because I know natokinase yeah. has some overlap effects with Lumbro, but it yes. also has some blood thinning effects that extend beyond what it does for just protein breakdown in a blood clot specifically. Yeah, well, I, I would call this more like your blood thinner on steroids or your awesome baby aspirin with 18 million other benefits. But yes, you can um, run into some issues with blood thinning medications. So another thing that um, some newer research has been shown is the, one of the biggest infections that drive heart disease that can start when you're very, very young, especially if you're an athlete, is nanobacteria. And that usually comes from eating um, overly cooked vegetables and you don't have enough HCL to kill the nanobacteria in your stomach, which even a young kid who is, has the ability to produce buttloads of HCL may not be able to do that if they've been running around outside all day and sweating like crazy and losing the chloride fraction that they need to produce the hydrochloric acid when they eat that meal. Because a lot of times that like kids, if they're running outside all day, sweating like crazy, dang near heat stroke, they run in and they want to eat something right away. So that uh, will cause the nanobacteria to carte blanche eventually through the entire circulatory tree, even into the um, pancreas and causing um, blood sugar issues. You're like, man, this person's in awesome shape and they're having all these blood sugar issues, it doesn't make sense. They, they're a long distance runner, they run at a seven minute per mile pace, and they still have high blood pressure. Well, one of the biggest reasons I believe is linked back to this nanobacterial infection, or if they're consuming boatloads of tap water, because chlorine will kind of have the same effect, which is going through and nicking up that endothelial lining. And then the body, of course, needs to start patching up that mess with cholesterol, which then hardens and then creates, you know, a, a, a mess of, a, of a, a situation for, you know, arteriosclerosis. So this yeah. is also a really good, an enzyme that's been shown to help decalcify and then heal the wound and then get the blood flowing properly. And then another thing to mention is blood coagulation. It becomes a really big problem the more EMF dense our environment gets. Our blood does not like electromagnetic fields. So it just becomes even more important when it comes to heart disease to use things that can help blood with blood coagulation. And between these two products, you know, they're, ulti they're my um, ultimate favorite ACEs. And, and you can, can so, oh, sorry, go ahead. They can be used clinically um, in the context of trying to improve the health and well being of the cardiovascular system, but also as a daily preventative strategy with no negative consequence. Because let's be honest, most people are walking around with some degree of compromise in the cardiovascular system. This would be something to look at, right? Yeah. Well, we have a, a saying at US Enzymes, none of us are allowed to die of heart attacks <laughs> 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 because of, we have such great products for that. So um, one thing to touch on, if, if you're going to try to work with a nanobacterial, support your patient through a nanobacterial infection, it takes a good 90 days to even 120 days to work through that. So if you're going to work on a protocol like that, make sure the patient takes the product every single day for that period of time. So an antibiotic effect isn't created and then the infection becomes more tolerant to um, the body's immune system being able to, to, to work it down. Very cool. Thank you for that. So we've talked about the ones that are more targeted for the cardiovascular system specifically, but Cerazyme also has some pretty strong research that it synergistically works with these other two. Now, I think Cerazyme, I think, um, you know, necrotic connective tissue, muscular tissue, things of that nature. Where does Cerazyme fit in the clinical perspective? Okay, so this is serratio peptidase, which for people who don't know what that is, it was discovered um, in a silkworm. They wanted to know how um, the silkworm casing was broken down and the moth could fly out. And, you know, there was this casing left and then the moth was completely fine. 
and there's zero scar tissue left over. So it turns out what the, that happens is the, the silkworm enacts serratio peptidase when it's ready to break out of its shell and the shell just slowly cracks open, no damage to the wings or to the, to the animal itself or no damage to the actual shell that's left behind. So it's something that dissolves scar tissue without harming healthy tissue. So scar tissue becomes a massive issue, especially in the liver, but also in the cardiovascular system from high fructose corn syrup and that epidemic. So this is a really nice way to slowly break down car, uh, scar tissue without damaging your um, natural uh, healthy tissues. And it's also a natural blood thinner, which is another reason why it's been kind of, it was kind of recognized at first for like high blood pressure. Then it was kind of like natokinase and lumbrokinase started to come along behind. And so th this is just kind of like, these three are just like an awesome like trio to take together or to, if you just want to use it for maintenance, just kind of pulse, you know, I'm going to take this one this month, this one this month, this one that month. Very cool. So those are the three that you would say are primed directly for the cardiovascular system yeah. and helping to break down the overarching concept of plaque formation and, you know, compromising the delivery of blood to cells and oxygenation and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. Well, NATO, to, to go back to NATO too, um, it's one of the number one things taken by long distance athletes to keep blood oxygen levels at maximum when they're training and when they're running a long period of time. So that should be also be noted. <clears throat> and to go back to dose, um, with the natozyme, 6,000 units of natokinase is usually what you'll see in any research study when it comes to cardiovascular health. And three, in three capsules, you'll get 6,400 6,600 units. So you get a little bit extra boost. So three of these a day is where you're going to want to sit for a patient um, to, to work on a therapeutic amount to support the immune system or to support the cardiovascular system. I usually have people take two at bed and one when they get up in the morning, wait 30 minutes or so to eat a main meal. You can have your coffee or whatever. Just give that um, capsule some time to get through the stomach so it can get into the bloodstream. And the same with serratio peptidase. So I just want to make sure that I covered dose. I've dosed that the same, the same way, two at bed, one in the morning. And it can be taken, they can be taken all together at the same time or with any medication that the patient might be taking it through before bed. There's no uh, contraindication there except for, you know, the blood thinner. Great points. And if anyone has clients who fly a lot, nothing better than taking some natokinase before a two or three hour long flight minimum. Because as you're in the plane, your blood starts to coagulate and that's a <clears> lot of a lot of the precipitating factors are something like thrombosis. But yeah. switching gears to look at sun spectrum. So this is not an enzyme product. This is a fiber plus nutrition. So what we have here is we have the hydrolyzed guar gum. We have uh, anti-inflammatory properties of turmeric, but we also have coenzyme Q10, which not only is an important molecule for blood health, specifically energy metabolism, it's got a dual phasic relationship because it also acts like an antioxidant to help with any kind of injury that may be happening in the arteries. Absolutely. So like this formulation you can look at is just like your ultimate gut, heart and brain formulation all in one. <clears throat> and it's completely free of glutamine, which, um, you know, a lot of people like to use for gut repair, but it isn't necessary. There are other ways to use um, things without having to use glutamine, which can fire mTOR pathways could potentially create um, some problems for a patient taken long term. The the turmeric that we use in, in this product is actually a, a very special form called C3 reduct, which is three times more bioavailable and has a three times greater half-life and it's completely water soluble. So um, in the turmeric world or the curcumin world, you have probably your basic powdered or liquid product, probably very low bioavailability, probably very low half-life. Then you'll have something with the black pepper added to it, a nicer product. That's going to last a little bit longer, have a greater bioavailability, but these are all, these two are going to be fat soluble products. So fat soluble nutrients can have um, problems, especially with uh, something like turmeric, which can be rancid very quickly once it's become ground. This is a patented formula where it's been water solubilized. So it doesn't hit the kidneys very hard and you get something that doesn't taste bad, which the patients actually love. And that's one of the number one knocks against, against turmeric is the smell or the taste. And you have something that is far more bioavailable and lasts far more um, in, in throughout, this, throughout the system with the half-life. 
And then we have to, you know, make mention of what the, the fiber itself does. You know, this fiber has been shown to be very good at being a precursor for the stimulus of butyrate production. And as you know, butyrate is a short chain fatty acid that acts uh, in a multitude of beneficial ways in the colon, it becomes a preferred source of fuel. It acts as what's called a histone deacetylase, so it can help offset inflammatory response. It really helps to strengthen the integrity of those tight junctions. And what helps lower inflammation locally in the gut likely has a positive effect systemically. So I think we're starting to see that research is showing that if you take care of the, the health and wellness of your gut, the functions of your gut, because the microbiome is an organ in and of itself, the peripheral benefits are experienced just as the, the specific local benefits are. Absolutely. And to, and to comment on the Q10 that we chose for this product, it's Konica's Q10, which is, it's basically ubiquinol. It's bioidentical Q10, and it does not come from tobacco or from shellfish. So it's a very, very, very clean source which um, a lot of people um, ask us about. And then we're going we're gonna to finish strong with my favorite product in the product line. I can finally say that I picked a favorite. They say you can't pick a favorite <laughs> child. I, I say you're wrong. Um, I've picked Youth Sun. And the reason I picked this, not because I found a superhero that bears its namesake. <laughs> now more than ever, we're seeing, an, you know, I, I want to use the term carefully, I almost said an epidemic, but it, we're seeing inflammatory conditions becoming more and more problematic. And anything that is inflammatory in nature is degrading to, to tissues, and we need antioxidants. And most people think glutathione, they think vitamin C, they think vitamin E. Not many people think superoxide dismutase or catalase. And inside the cell, the intracellular environment, yes, glutathione peroxidase is the most powerful antioxidant to some degree, but it's more so the final aspect of the sequencing of antioxidant activity. So catalase initiates the process, superoxide dismutase comes in the middle, and then if that needs further antioxidant activity, reduction, if you will, glutathione peroxidase cleans up. But we take all kinds of NAC boosting products, we'll do liposomal glutathione. Very seldomly do we get catalase and superoxide dismutase for the systemic intracellular benefits because every cell in the body requires these three antioxidant enzymes to be functioning. That's so true. And uh, again, when it comes to sourcing, um, this product is very unique on the sourcing side. It has a melon base, which is fairly com common in, um, in the market, which is, is good, but it has a fermented source, which we're the only um, factory um, in America that's allowed to source that through Korea. And that has some phenomenal aspects to it when it comes to um, harmonizing with the catalase. And most importantly, and some doctors that are well-versed on things that may be some, somewhat sensitive to stomach acid, SOD can definitely be, but this product has a patent in it, which 100% protects the SOD from stomach acid. So if you look at, again, the activity and the amount of catalase and superoxide dismutase that is in this product, it is off the charts, um, hands down. And this product will go yeah. very well with almost anyone who's dealing with some kind of chronic degenerative condition as a way to keep the body in a holding pattern where you can remove the stimuli because ultimately we are not healing the body's clinicians. We're working with the body so it is able to heal itself. And if it's in a chronically oxidized state, we can't really do that. And then looking at immunozyme, I call this the immune system multivitamin. If the immune system is agitated or aggravated in the cardiovasculature, uh, we know that an inflammatory response is there. And oftentimes nutritional deficiencies are one of the things that are root causative to that. What, what do you have to add, Jason? Yeah, well, like your graphic was perfect on that, showing a potential immune situation pushing up against an artery. So the best way to support that is from the top down, support T regulatory system. And then of course, vitamin K2 has got all kinds of great research um, when it comes to the cardiovascular system. And then um, there's some probiotic strains here that are very unique and very hard to find on the market that are protected um, from the stomach acid with uh, our, our patent that have probably some of the best and most consistent and long-term research on supporting interleukin-10 and supporting the T regulatory system. So you get a lot of beautiful things all in one product here at a therapeutic amount. So two capsules will still do the trick. And these, um, this one, it doesn't seem to matter um, with what time to take it. It's like two in the morning, one in the morning, one at night. 
Um, so I'll leave it up to clinician to decide, you know, how to dose that. But to take a step back on the Uzyme, that one I find is critical to take at bedtime. And the typical dose there to hit therapy would be two a day and take it taken awesome. at bedtime. And, you know, just to piggyback and, and wrap up what you said there, fat soluble vitamins are probably very, very deficient in most people because it's hard to get vitamin A from a lot of food sources. If you live north of the Mason Dixon line, you're not making an, any vitamin D until right. maybe, I don't know, or late March, early April. Uh, and vitamin K2, if you don't have a good microbiome, you can't rely upon your own endogenous synthesis. And just to make an honorable mention to wrap it up today, you know, we're talking about the idea of helping your gut to help your cardiovascular system. They're looking at specific strains of even lactobacillus plantarum and their ability to help regulate healthy cholesterol levels because they have the ability to help break down excessive cholesterol that the liver has lost its ability based upon potentially it being compromised or underfunctioning. We know that cholesterol isn't necessarily the problem, but it plays a role in the body's attempt to heal, but it gets a bad rap for how it's incorporated into things like arterial plaque formation. So, you know, the world is waking up to this. The, the, the strains of certain species of bacteria or the certain strains rather of various species of bacteria are becoming a very intricate part to the process when it comes to maintaining systemic health. And I'll end in saying that, you know, everything really is connected. And I hope we did a fairly good job of drawing some basic connections tonight. And if anyone does want any further follow-up, please, I do encourage you to reach out to your reps. We're available to chat about this stuff and anything else. As you can tell, we kind of like this stuff.